So now please join me in welcoming Hillary Rodham Clinton and Cheryl Strayed to Book Expo. Hi, Hillary. Hey, Cheryl. <laughs> we need a glass of wine or a cup of coffee or something. Yeah. Which would you prefer, wine or coffee? Uh, let's try Chardonnay. Yeah. The time of the day. See, one of the things I want to tell you, uh, one of the, the benefits of not being the president of the United States and being a writer instead, is you get to drink. <laughs> um, so I want to start, we're going to, um, I have some questions for, from the audience, but, and I have some of my own, but I wanted to start with, I think, the most moving question I got from somebody in the audience, and that is, do you know how much you mean to us and how much we love you? I, I am um, really touched by that, and let me thank you. Thank you for that really kind thought, and I'm thrilled that Cheryl's here with us. Um, she's one of my favorite authors, and one of the people that I've gotten to know over the last couple of years. And uh, I have to tell you, as booksellers, I hope you know how much you mean to me, uh, because it has been a central part of my life for as long as I can remember. Libraries and bookstores are right at the top of my favorite things to do, so thank you. So you um, have been really quite busy. You've got two books coming out in September. Let's talk about those. And let's start with It Takes a Village. So this was obviously this hugely influential book. Um, published in 2006, and now you've decided uh, to, to release it as a, a children's book edition. Can you talk about that? What, what, what inspired you to, to do that? Well, it was published in 1996, oh, no. and, and the reason I um, was motivated to do it uh, may sound a little bit deja vu all over again, but if you remember back to those years, uh, there were people in politics in our Congress who were making uh, incredibly harmful uh, proposals, saying hurtful things. And when I heard, uh, at that point, Newt Gingrich say that we should take poor children away from their families and put them in orphanages, I was just beyond upset and outraged, and I had been uh, a children's advocate. I'd worked for the Children's Defense Fund. Obviously, I was a mom. So I thought there has to be a different way of bringing people together around our common responsibilities and what it means to be part of a community. Of course, you're an individual. And I say in the beginning of the, of the book, It Takes a Village, that, uh, you know, the most important people in a child's life are the child's family, but the community also plays a very big role in providing not just education and health care, but law enforcement and all kinds of you know, religious uh, instruction, uh, everything that goes into making up a community. So I had long been um, really taken by the African proverb, it takes a village, and so that's why I wrote uh, that book, and it became a, a kind of, pa uh, you know, password in a way to talk about what we meant by community and what our obligations were. And it became politically uh, controversial in some circles. Um, it was the topic of a number of uh, speeches from the uh, Republican National Convention in 1996, uh, attacking me for, I never know what they're attacking me for, but. <laughs> 
long line of that, and uh, it, it, it has stayed with me, so that's why I thought it would be time to maybe bring those concepts of community and citizenship and cooperation and support for kids into uh, a children's book, and how lucky was I that uh, Marla Frazee was available to do the illustrations. So it's a beautiful book, and it is something I'm really proud of. Awesome. Well, remember when our moms would tell us when we were young, if a boy is teasing you, it means he really likes you? Maybe that's what the Republicans are doing. <laughs> um. Well, if that's the case, <laughs> I think enough is enough. <laughs> she will go to the dance with you, okay? Um, so you also have another book coming out on the same day. It'll be in September. Uh, what can you tell us about this book? Well, this book is, uh, for me, a really um, personal, deep experience, and I also have to say an emotional catharsis. Um, for a long time, I've collected quotes that were inspirational or funny or in some way meaningful to me uh, to try to capture a thought or to buck me up uh, when I needed it. And I've shared them with my friends uh, over all those years. And I even had a little uh, book that I carried them around in. And, you know, you'd have a, a tough time or a funny time or a quiet time. And I'd flip through them and, and get reminded uh, of what they meant to me. And after the election, I was thinking, as I was going through all those quotations, um, how it was spurring my thoughts about uh, the life I've led and the ups, the downs, the great opportunities, uh, the accomplishments, the disappointments, and how during the course of the campaign, there were so many people who shared their own stories with me. And it is one of the real treasures of being out in the public eye. There's a lot that you see which is, you know, very difficult to be clear, you know that. But those moments when somebody grabs your hand or when you're backstage and a total stranger comes up and, and tells you their story or tells you that, you know, they understand what you're going through or they want you to know that, you know, they're with you, uh, like the first question today, uh, that is incredibly meaningful to me. And so I began to go through all those quotations, and then I began to really reflect about uh, the country and my life and really what happened in this election, and to start to put my thoughts down on paper in a way that I think is not just about me and not just about an election, but about resilience, uh, about, you know, getting back up when you're knocked down, because everybody is, where you find the courage to do that, and what helps you along the way. And um, it's, as I say, proven to be uh, an extraordinary, very personally meaningful, but painful experience. It really is painful. So we've seen you get up many times after being knocked down. And, and I think this, this is where this first question, we first walked on stage, came from. How did you muster the strength to go on after the election? What, what, where did you find solace? I know you've taken a lot of walks in the woods, which, <laughs> which you know I love. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, so we were talking backstage, and, and Hillary doesn't yet have a title for this, this book she just told you about. And my suggestion is really wild. Um, you've got the walking in the woods, you've got the hardship, you've got the resilience. How do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think yeah. it's really wild. That's pretty good. <laughs> it's really pretty wild. So if you see it in bookstores, exactly. it came from Cheryl. <laughs> so my question to you is about, is about you know, the, the, those, uh, those moments when we feel we can't go on. You said that writing this book was cathartic. Tell us about that. Well, you know, I, I guess I believe that um, resilience is one of the, the great attributes and gifts that you can uh, be given through family, through friends, through your faith, through whatever gives you that sense of um, purpose and courage that it takes to keep going. And I've been blessed to know 
so many people over the course of my life who have faced such really difficult and painful experiences, whether it was the death of a loved one, a disease they're fighting, uh, the midst of a horrible weather condition, like a hurricane, I mean, I've, 9-11, I've just, I've seen in my own life, as well as the lives of so many whom I've been uh, able to get to know, uh, the most extraordinary capacity to keep going. And, and so I don't in any way compare myself with the uh, really difficult, terrible times that others have gone through. I have a, a great friend here in the city, well, two great friends that I made after 9-11 who were grievously injured. I mean, just the most horrific burns in one case and was in an induced coma for two months, and the other who was struck down by part of the landing gear of one of the planes hitting the towers. And I have just been both honored and humbled to see how they have kept going. So what's happened to me happens in public in a very uh, you know, personal way. And what I'm trying to do in the book is to explain what it is like to uh, try to break through barriers, uh, knowing how hard it is, knowing that you're going to make mistakes, knowing that there's all kinds of uh, you know, challenges uh, every step of the way, uh, but to explain what I've relied on, what has given me hope and courage and resilience. Um, and a lot of it, for me, is rooted in my family, rooted in my friends, because I've been really lucky uh, in both. But a lot of it is also because I have this determination, as, a, as someone said about me the other day, uh, a stubbornness that, you know, you just get up every day and you do the best you can. You know, it's literally one foot in front of the other. And when you are fighting for something larger than yourself, which is what I've always believed, that keeps you going even when you're down and nearly out um, personally. So this book covers a lot of that and it covers some of the experiences that you all watched, but from you know, my perspective as to how it felt. Um, and it, it is sometimes, you know, I'll work on it for a couple of hours. I have a little uh, writing area in the attic of our little farmhouse. We live, you know, about 50 minutes north of here. And, you know, I work on it, and I've got, you know, great colleagues who are doing research and, and, and helping me think through how best to present things. And it's so exhausting that I just literally have to get up, either go for a walk or go to bed. Those are my yeah. two choices. I, I can relate to that, yeah. I'm curious, it's really interesting to me, because you're right, I mean, the art of memoir is about subjectivity. It's about telling the true story of what it felt like to be you in that moment. And most memoirs don't have that, that story wasn't also a public story. And you're unique in that regard. And yet one of the, the things that memoir demands, I think good memoir de demands, that you be vulnerable, you take risks, you, you tell that truth, what it was you were, were really thinking and feeling. Um, but as somebody who's had to, you know, be such a public person, how do you navigate that? How do you find that place of vulnerability in your work? That's my first question. My second question is, um, are you going there f further in this next book than you've gone before because you're in a different position? Absolutely. Well, I'm certainly going a lot further, and I think that both the experience and the choices we face in the future demand that I go as far as I can. And what you said really resonated with me. This is my truth. And people can disagree, and guess what? They will, I'm sure. Um, but this is how I experienced uh, being the first woman to, you know, break that barrier, uh, get, you know, get nominated, stand on a, cha a stage for debates. It, deal with all of the incredibly odd, bizarre happenings that were uh, around. 
Um, and, 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 I, and I'm very clear in that. I'm saying, look, you may think you know what happened, and you may be right to a certain extent based on what you've perceived and how you process it, but I'm going to tell you how I saw it and what I felt and what I thought um, because you cannot make up what happened. And uh, <laughs> I... Um, <laughs> I think that's part of the reason why it's such an incredible experience trying to write it because even I forgot some of the wacky things that were said and done and to you know, pull that all back out and, and try to be both personal but as dispassionate as possible uh, and, and to explain. And part of the, the motivation is not only it's good for my mental health, but I think it is also really important that we come to grips with what we need to do in the future as, uh, as a country. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful coincidence that I'm doing the children's book at the same time because the children's book is really, in many ways, rooted in the idea of citizenship. You know, what, how do we give our children the tools that they need, not only for their own lives, but to be active citizens, and how do they then cooperate with people? And so thinking about this election and all the lines that were drawn and the partisanship and everything that was flying at us, it's important for me to say, look, this is how I experienced it. And I think that's, I don't know if you had the same experience with Wild, because, you know, lots of people have hiked the Pacific Coast um, trail, but this was your truth, your experience, and part of the reason it was so powerful is you could feel that. And it, you know, somebody else could, could hike it tomorrow and they wouldn't have the same experience. And somebody else could run for president tomorrow or in four years. They won't have the same experience, right? So part of what I'm Can trying to do- somebody else please run for president tomorrow? <laughs> Yeah, that's a long tomorrow. Uh, so that, that's how I'm. That's how I'm trying to convey it. And yeah, it really, it really is a, you know, as, as I think of it, a kind of unvarnished, uh, you know, view of what I think happened and putting myself into, you know, these different events and and sort of pulling the curtain back so that readers can say, well, what was it like standing on the stage debating your opponent? What was going through your head? And you will find out what was going through my head. We can, I'm, I think I speak for all of us when I say we cannot wait to read it. Um, what I'm curious about, what, you know, you said that sometimes you have to walk out of your, your shed and, and go for a walk or take a nap or have a glass of Chardonnay. What's the hardest, to talk to me about some challenges. What are the hardest parts of you, for, for you when it comes to writing this book? Well, you know, really there are, there are so many hard parts, but it just here, here's how maybe I would, would talk about it. One is the, you know, the, the really painful experience of honestly understanding, you know, what I didn't do well or what I didn't do well enough or what our shortcomings were, where we, you know, missed an opportunity, where we didn't um, do, uh, in retrospect, what might have worked better. And, and that's obviously painful, but it's a kind of pain that is um, part of being in politics. And, you know, I've won races, I've lost races, I've never felt the way I feel about this, and that brings me to the second piece of it, because the more you dig and the more you understand what we're up against, and taking me out of the equation so that it's not about, okay, what happened to you, it's what happened to us, and how much more alert we need to be uh, as a nation, and obviously I'm particularly uh, concerned about the role that Russia played and the very serious interference that we know 
uh, they uh, were responsible for in our most fundamental democratic act. That in some ways is even more painful. You know, when I, when I ran in 2008, uh, and I, I write a little bit about this, you know, losing was hard, but it was such a hard fought contest and I had so much respect for Barack Obama. And, you know, it wasn't fun losing, but I didn't worry about my country. And I immediately turned around and went to work to help him get elected and then surprisingly got asked to be Secretary of State. So yes, you lose and, you know, it hurts your feelings and you wish you had done better and you would have liked to have won, but I didn't worry about my country. I am really worried and I worry not just because there are partisan differences, but we're, we're living in such an abnormal time uh, when we look at the way that this White House is behaving about some of the biggest challenges we face, the dishonesty and fabrication, and whether you call it fake news or lies, pick your choice. Uh, it is deeply troubling, and it is also worrisome that it could cause lasting damage to our institutions. So part of what I'm writing is, okay, I'm gonna talk about how it felt with what I think was in my control and what we could have done better and you know, wish we had. But I'm also gonna talk about what happened that was totally unprecedented in American history and what are we gonna do about it? How do we think about the future and our responsibilities, whatever political party or philosophy you have, you can't be all right with the idea that a foreign adversary was trying to influence the outcome of our election. And that to me is a big challenge that we are going to face as a country. And so I talk about that, I try to explain uh, what that, uh, you know, what that, what happened and what that means for us uh, to try to arm citizens, to try to give people a simple as possible explanation that then they can go out and be um, active and speak up uh, so that, yeah, let's have our debates about everything that we argue about in politics, but that should be among us. That should be between Americans, <laughs> not with you know somebody influencing uh, how people were thinking and the information that they got and the conclusions that they drew and the decisions that they then made. So it's, it's that tension uh, between the personal disappointment, which, you know, that, that comes with the territory. And I said the other day, you know, I'm fine as a person, but I'm worried as an American. And that's what I'm trying to unpack and explain to people as well. I think it's really interesting that your writing and in your, your career uh, that has always been intricately bound your experience with the experience of the world. From your very first speech, your, your um, 1969 speech at Wellesley, you were talking about the meaning of your life within the context of what was happening politically and socially and culturally. And where do you, I mean, where did that come from? That sense of, what I'm struck by as you talk about this book, and when I think about all of the books you've written, that there is no separating you from those, you know, the political realities. Where does that, where, where did that begin? You know, it really does begin with my parents. You know, I had a very um, typical suburban 1950s upbringing. Uh, my dad was a World War II vet, a small businessman, uh, worked hard, scraped every, you know, penny that he made from getting the, you know, business started and then trying to make it successful so we could have a nice house and he could, you know, give us a good, you know, good solid middle class life. And my mother had a, a very, uh, a very sad and difficult life, um, abandoned by her parents and then literally thrown out of her grandparents' home and went to work at the age of 13 working in somebody else's home. So they had very very different experiences, um, but together they just had such a deep conviction about how lucky we were to be in this country. And even though my mother canceled out my father's vote every election, uh, they talked about the news, 
You know, we, we talked about it at dinner. My dad would, you know, ask uh, if we had opinions and he would kind of grill me. So literally from the time of childhood, being an American was part of my identity. And I had great public school teachers all the way from kindergarten through high school uh, who also instilled in me that sense of civic responsibility and citizenship. And it may sound, you know, really old fashioned, out of date now, but it was part of the glue that held us together as a country. Uh, and in the neighborhood that I lived in, all the fathers, you know, had served in the military during the Second World War. All the mothers stayed home. Uh, they did PTA things. They did other volunteer activities. And at a very early age, they enlisted us. You know, it was part of our responsibility to, you know, put up the lemonade stand and, you know, raise money to give to you know, kids who were in the hospital or poor kids, you know, living somewhere in the world. It was just a, it was a, a very open time because the world seemed like it was out there waiting for us. And America was really coming into its own in a way that was tangible even to a child. I remember in the fifth grade, my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Krause, after Sputnik went up, marches into our fifth grade classroom and says, we are supposed to do better in math and science because President Eisenhower wants us to. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that would happen in our, our classrooms. And so, okay, we're supposed to do better. And then we get to junior high and President Kennedy's there and all of a sudden we get tested on our physical fitness because we have to be physically active in order to be good Americans. This was part of the whole ambiance of how we were raised, not just in our families, but in our schools and elsewhere. And, you know, I just always thought it was part of who I was and, and it became a big part of what I cared about. And when you were doing sit-ups for, for Kennedy and, and doing silence for Eisenhower and so forth, what were you reading? What books were you reading? What books were influential to you as you uh, became a young woman? Well, I got in trouble during the physical fitness part because we were supposed to jump. And you mean the, the broad jump? Which yeah. I have to this day can yeah. never... Yeah, and, and the vertical jump up on the side of the yeah. wall. And they kept coming around to me and they said, jump. I said, I have jumped. <laughs> it just never took with me. Um, Do you, are, are you athletic in any, I mean, besides for the hiking? I, you know, I, I was when I was growing up. I, I, I played sports. Um, I played softball. I, I played tennis. I swam and dove. And, you know, I haven't actually kept up with that for but, many but years. But now it's just mostly walking and hiking. Yeah, mostly walking. So are yeah. we going to go hike the Pacific Crest Trail this summer together? That would be great. Let's do it. I would love that. Okay. Yeah, it's I a, mean, it's if a we, date. If we go with, you know, <laughs> if we go with really wild. With really wild. Really wild. And we'll do a whole publicity campaign <laughs> on the Pacific Crest Trail. And we get a pop-up bookstores. Yeah. Right? All on the trail. I know, yeah. Well, but there'll be. I think that's a great idea. So you love. I love. Books I love stores. reading. I've yes. always loved reading, and uh, well, you know, I, I think like a lot of uh, a lot of uh, young girls of my time, you know, I read every Nancy Drew book. I liked the early ones better than the later ones. I'll be honest. I the idea that you ha that you know sh she she just seemed like such a. Uh, go-getter and really smart and brave and... Kind of like someone we know. No, well, there's a lot of, a, a lot of, I heard the, the applause, I think, and, and it was like a model um, for me and uh, for my friends. And that, when I think back, you know, I, I read a lot, I read a lot of uh, books when I was growing up, but that had a big impact on me because she was, you know, dare I say, a little bit of a role model. You know, and, and I always felt so bad because her mother had died. Yeah. And so, but there she, I mean, she was taking care of the house. She was going to school. She was solving mysteries. I mean, really, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's, there's a real tradition in literature um, with uh, young women or girls whose mothers are dead. 
um, because their, their main protectors are gone and they are, they're forced to venture out into the world and be courageous. And, and I think that Nancy Drew absolutely was an inspiration to so many um, girls and women for that reason. My own daughter loved them too. What about in those post-election months? Mm. Do you turn to literature for consolation like so many of us do? I do. I also turn to it for total distraction. Yeah. And I, I've kept a record of every book I've read uh, during my entire adulthood. Oh my gosh, yeah. how many have you read? I don't know, I haven't counted them. I just, but I, I have one of those books that has no, you know, that has yeah. nothing in them. Uh -huh. And so I've been, I've been tracking them. And uh, I was thinking about it the other day. After the election, um, I read a lot of mysteries. I am a very <laughs> devoted mystery reader, but I also, there, I have some favorites. Um, I love, in, I love Jacqueline Winspear and Maisie Dobbs. I love uh, uh, Donna Leone and Bringing Venice Alive, and I love Louise Penny. Um, and I, I had the great joy uh, a couple of months after the election of meeting Louise Penny, and I, I really, you know, I just got so into her. Uh, characters and, and her locale, Three Pines, you know, it just made a, a big impression on me. And so it was really fun talking to somebody who has written this series using the same characters, you know, always have a murder, but, you know, use the same characters. And I just loved that. So I read a lot of mysteries and uh, it, it was very comforting because it was somebody else's problem, you know? <laughs> they had to go off and solve the murder and uh, save the day and I loved that. That's wonderful. So when you're writing, um, I know your editor is in the room, but who is your most trusted reader aside from your editor? My husband. Yeah. Yeah. My so husband. does he read everything you write? He reads a lot of what I write um, and he's a very tough uh, critic and cross-examines me on why something's in or why something's out. Um, but he's been, uh, really we started dating in, uh, when we were in law school and uh, I had, uh, I, I worked my way through law school. I had a small scholarship but then I had a lot of jobs and I had a job editing a long paper for um, an international law student. And it was the first time that, you know, he sat down with me and we talked it over and he gave me great advice. So he uh, has always been my, my uh, closest and most critical reader. Yeah, that's what husbands are good for. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. Mine too. Um, so let's, I wanted to go back to that Wellesley speech you gave when you were graduating. And it was full of, uh, I would say, I mean, you pointed out the troubles in the world, but there was also a great sense of hope. And I'm curious about what you think right now. As you just mentioned, I, I do agree with you, and I think um, we're not alone in this, is that we feel like, you know, that, that something different has happened in America than has happened before. And some of our very principles of our democracy are really at risk. And I'm curious about how, you know, are you hopeful? And if the answer is yes, which I, I really hope it is, uh, how do we do it? I mean, we're, I think we're really in a pickle. And how do we move forward with uh, less division, more kindness? Well, I had the uh, experience recently of really thinking hard about all of this, because you're right, I, I spoke, I was the first student speaker at Wellesley back in 1969. And then I spoke at the Wellesley graduation last weekend. And I went back and reread the speech from 1969, and I thought hard about what I wanted to say to the graduates, but also uh, to the you know, broader world. And yeah, I think the bottom line is I am hopeful, but I really think hope needs to be uh, linked to a strategy. Uh, for dealing with what we are facing. And some of it is very personal acts. You mentioned kindness. I mean, you know, that is a much overlooked uh, attribute. 
uh, in these days. And uh, showing kindness, showing support for one another. I mean, I'm still just sickened by what happened in Portland with those two young men coming to the rescue of those young women who were being uh, insulted and verbally abused by the white supremacist uh, on the train. And when they attempted to reason with this man and to intervene, he killed them both and he wounded a third man who tried to also speak up. I, I'm deeply troubled by that. And that's not the only incident that we've seen where all of a sudden it, it appears that there are attitudes and feelings that are bursting through the the veneer of civilization. You know, we, we I think, have done uh, a lot in the last uh, centuries uh, to deal with some of the intractable problems, not just race and sexism and ethnicity and religion, but also what's an appropriate way of treating a fellow person? One of the reasons I love living in New York is that it's just elbow to elbow with people from everywhere. And you've got to figure out how you, you know, how you accommodate that, how you work with that. Uh, and it, it really does call out uh, a, a level of behavior that it should be expected of everyone. And what I saw in this election was a deliberate effort to blow the top off of that, to basically say, whatever feeling you have, whatever you know, resentment, however angry you might be, get out there and express it. And it's okay to you know, take it out on other people, verbally or physically, uh, as we saw during the campaign. That is incredibly dangerous. You know, that is unleashing a level of uh, vitriol and uh, defensiveness, hatred, that I don't think we uh, should tolerate. You know, as Secretary of State, um, you know, I, I traveled the world on behalf of our country and I did that as a senator, I did it as a first lady, I've been incredibly lucky. And I will tell you, it doesn't take much to rip off the politeness and the accommodation that really keeps diverse peoples working and living together. We saw it in Bosnia, uh, where it was deliberately uh, intended to inflame neighbor against neighbor. We saw it in Rwanda. I've seen it in many other places where political leaders, for their own purposes, their own power, greed, ideology, religion, whatever it might be, uh, really light those flames. And there's always kindling there. There's always people who are nursing a grievance, who feel that they weren't treated right, who think somebody's getting ahead, who see the world as a zero-sum game. Uh, and so those thoughts were very much present in my mind as I went back to Wellesley and, you know, tried to, you know, say to the graduates, um, you're, you're coming out of this great education you've been given uh, at a time of a lot of turmoil, a lot of questioning. Uh, Please find your role. And something as simple as wherever you end up, go register to vote. Get involved to the point where your voice will actually be added to those with whom you agree. Or even if you don't agree on everything, people of reason wanting to get together. And I told them, I think we're living at a time when there's a deliberate assault on truth and reason. And, you know, I, I think uh, the Enlightenment was a pretty good deal. And it helped to provide the intellectual and philosophical underpinnings of our founders. And I still believe that, you know, we are uh, the, the greatest, you know, man-made invention in the history of uh, the world. And we can't give up on that and we can't get discouraged and we have to figure out ways we're going to keep going. Yeah, I think that phrase, people of reason, is one that just I hunger for now. I've never been so nostalgic for so many Republicans in my life um, as I am now, because I think that that's, what's, that's what we're missing out on. So as you know, last May, 
I introduced you in San Francisco at an event. And one of the things I said about you, that I, I think the thing that probably got the loudest applause, was I said that Hillary Clinton made the world ready for Hillary Clinton. And what I meant by that was that you, I mean, one of the reasons that you inspire me and so many others is that you always have fought really hard and blazed a trail, you know, that you really have gone places where no woman has gone before. And of course, you're standing on the shoulders of so many women who came before you. Um, I think whenever we say she blazed her own trail, we also mean, and, and then the, uh, the women who came before her, who got her to the place where she could even blaze that trail. And, you know, things didn't turn out the way we hoped. But one thing that I've, that's given me a sense of hope in these months since the election is that the, the work you did, everything you accomplished in the course of, of that campaign season, um, really will help that next woman who comes along and becomes our first woman president. Yes. So I want to thank you for that. I want to thank yeah. you for that. And I, you know, I, I do have a little side gig as an advice giver, and I'm not going to give you advice, unless you want it. You Please. can ask me anything. Absolutely. But uh, what I would like you to do is to imagine that woman who will become our first female president. What advice do you have for her? What words do you have for her? Read my book. <laughs> <laughs> um, because... Um, I want her to fully understand what she's getting herself into because it is unlike any experience she will, has ever had before. She might be a governor, she might be a senator, she might be... A writer. A writer, yes. <laughs> she might be a business executive, who knows what, what she might be. but. Our system in our country is the most difficult political environment in the world of any democracy to elect a leader. Why do I say that? If you look at a lot of the women who become heads of government in the UK, uh, Chancellor Merkel in Germany, uh, Golda Meir, uh, Indira Gandhi, Benazir Bhutto, if you look at the names that we know well over the course of the last 50, 60 years, they often arise from a parliamentary system. And in a parliamentary system, you run in a small constituency where people actually know you, where they can evaluate you because maybe they'll see you at the grocery store or they've come to one of your events or your children are in school together, whatever it might be. And then you are selected by your peers to be their leader. So again, your colleagues who are in your party in a parliament, they see, oh, you know, Cheryl, she's a great worker. She knows how to get things done. And you move up the, uh, the scale. In our system, you start from scratch. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, how qualified you are, it doesn't matter. You can stand up and say, I'm going to run for president. And then you have to go out and you have to talk to the entire country. And you have to raise a lot of money, go through the gauntlet that American presidential campaigns are. Now, I think there's some benefit to that because it is uh, the hardest job in the world, or at least it used to be the hardest job in the world, and it, um, and you have to be prepared for what it means to be literally brutalized. You know, the things that will be said and the way you'll be treated, it just kind of goes with the territory. And that's not that to say that, you know, men don't get uh, harsh treatment and aren't put in the spotlight but you are carrying the burden of the double standard, and you have to know that. And it is, um, in, in, you know, in my book, I, I take on the issues of sexism and misogyny. 
uh, and talk about it because we need to pull it out and put it in the bright light. And it may be uncomfortable for some people uh, to read how I experienced it, what I believe about it, but I think that's a conversation we need to have. And so for this future woman candidate, um, it will be, you know, my, uh, I hope I'm still around, it will be my great, uh, you know, privilege to be able to say, okay, I'll give you my best uh, experience, my best advice, uh, but everybody has to find, you know, her or his own way, and I, I hope that uh, it'll be sooner instead of later. And that she'll be progressive, yeah. Well, yeah, that... Just because you run doesn't mean you earn that's the vote, right? right? Yeah, you, that's you know, right. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to open it up now to questions from the audience. I have a few here. Um, Anna from Kansas City said, what is your favorite book from childhood? So Nancy Drew, but did you have one? Did you have a... Do you have one favorite? Well, I've said this before, and it's interesting because... Uh, I was obviously a, a young teenager when I read Brothers Karamazov, and I read some years ago that it was also one of Laura Bush's favorite books, and I, I found that coincidence really fascinating, but you know, that was one that stuck with me uh, and has to this day. Okay, Martha from Silver Spring, Maryland says, what's currently on your nightstand, and what's on your grandchildren's nightstand? Do they have a nightstand? Maybe not. No, they have stacks on the floor. <laughs> um, they have lots of books, but I'm, I just finished a terrific book that uh, I was just totally captivated by called Jersey Brothers by Sally Mott Freeman, and it's the story of three brothers during World War II all of whom are in the Navy, one of whom becomes a prisoner of war in the Philippines. Uh, the other is uh, an officer, uh, you, know, on, you know, in the fleet, uh, working with uh, the admirals who are waging the war in the Pacific. And the third, uh, Admiral Mott, because he stayed in the Navy, uh, started off in the uh, White House as one of the naval aides to President Roosevelt. And that was, I mean, the, the book itself is a great read, and, and the author has done this amazing job of recreating dialogue that just seems so authentic. I mean, even, you know, she, she researched it for 10 years, and, you know, as somebody who is in the midst of writing my own book, I mean, the amount of work that went into that and the imagination that she brought to it, but I had a personal connection, and that is when I was first lady, the map room, which is what it was called when Roosevelt had all these maps on the wall and Churchill would come to stay in the White House and they'd come down from the residence and Roosevelt would be in his wheelchair and Churchill would be smoking his cigar and they'd go into the map room. And in addition to this uh, main character of uh, Jersey Brothers, he talks about a young lieutenant named George Elsie. And George Elsie was one of the aides to Roosevelt as well. And the reason that was important to me is that when I became first lady, I said, this used to be so historic and it's kind of like a, you know, a waiting room now or a meeting room, a small meeting room. I said, do you think there's anything left from the map room? And we looked and searched and the, what we could find was already in archives. And then George Elsie, by that time, you know, an elderly man came forward and said, you know, I did roll up some maps. And he gave us a map, and it was a map from the European theater, and we, po we, we put it up above the fireplace there. So I'm reading this book totally entranced in it, and all of a sudden, it's like this personal connection. So that, that has been at the top of my nightstand. The magic of books. Okay. And booksellers. This one is from Lauren from Mystic, Connecticut. She says, please visit us again at Savoy Bookshop in Westerly, Rhode Island. Is Savoy in the house? All right, hi. What's the role, and this is a really important question for me, I, I must say as an author, um, what is the role of independent booksellers in the current political culture? Oh, it is more important than ever. Um, I, I, as I said, I love bookstores and I love independent booksellers and the stores that so many of you, um, you know, own, run, work in. And it is more important than ever, and I, I hope it's true what I'm reading, that independent bookstores are on a real 
upward trajectory. Is that true? I hope. Um, and indeed, yeah. It is. It is really encouraging to me that so many people are going back to uh, bookstores, that they're buying, you know, real books that they can hold, touch, and turn the corners down, and all the things we do with our books. Um, so we cannot have enough um, discussion. You know, one of my really dear friends, uh, Lisa Muscatine, she and her husband, uh, Brad, own Politics and Prose in Washington. And they have not just authors' events, uh, I know you were there once, but they have discussions now where people are concerned about health care or the environment. You know, what does it mean to pull out of the Paris Accord as we apparently are going to do? Or immigration? Or, you know, what does NATO really mean? I mean, using the bookstore, the independent bookstore, as a, a gathering place, a community center to discuss some of these issues and bringing an author whenever possible uh, to be part of that. So I think that the role has always been important, but I, I think it's even more so now. Uh, and you would ask me about my grandchildren, and you know, we, we took really seriously the advice to read to your children. And so we've been reading to Charlotte and Aiden, you know, from the very beginning. And you know, Chelsea has this new wonderful book out I will plug called She Persisted, uh, which is a children's book about American women. And so I was over there. I was over there the other day, and you can't. I mean, just as as a mom and as a as a grandmother. Uh, to see my daughter reading the book she wrote about American women to my granddaughter and my grandson. And it doesn't get any better than that. So, beautiful. Children's books for sure. And it, it just so happens that the next question from Renee in Belmore, New York, it's along these lines. As you said, Chelsea just published a new book called She Persisted. And the, Renee wants to know if you and Chelsea have ever thought about writing a book together. Maybe a mother-daughter, a book about mother and daughter relationships or how to raise a strong uh, feminist kid, male or female. Um, have, you, have the two of you discussed that at all? No, but I will now. That's um, right. I, I think that's a we're gonna, really We're going to have a book idea. deal by the end of the night, right? <laughs> I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. I do too. So um, another question. Um, we, we sort of uh, touched on this a bit, but specifically during the campaign, did you have any time to read or were you just reading the news constantly? <clears throat> it, you know, I didn't really have a lot of time. Uh -huh. And, and that's, that's a big uh, loss for me because, you know, I read usually every night before I fall asleep, but I'd be so tired by the end of those long days and having to get up early in the morning. Um, I, I didn't really, other than reams of briefing papers, uh, I had this old fashioned idea that, you know, the policies you proposed would actually be important uh, in <laughs> governing your country. So we spent a lot of time and I spent many nights going over, you know, what we were going to do to, you know, increase uh, wages and jobs and, uh, you know, all of the, the, the real gutty issues that uh, we were concerned about, but I didn't have much time for any pleasure reading. Yeah. So have you, Paula from San Diego wants to know, um, have you read John Lewis's March Trilogy? Have you read it? It's amazing. I, I have not read it, but I, I, I know of it very well. John's a, a long time dear friend of mine. Right. And she says, so even if you haven't read the, those books, certainly you know his work and his message. And Paula wants to know how can we continue applying that vision and that message that people like John Lewis and, and others, um, spreading that kind of justice and kindness and equality, that, that struggle. How do we continue that struggle in these times? That's a great question. You know, uh, John is the first person that I ever heard use the phrase beloved community. And it was in one of his early writings, it was in his speeches, uh, it was really motivated by his faith, by his, his courageous witness as a civil rights leader and activist. Uh, and as long as I've known him, that has been what's driven him. How do we bring people together? How do we cross the divides? And I think 
it's, it's pretty clear it's more important now than it has been for a long time. And part of what I'm doing in the book is trying to think through uh, what are practical suggestions that anybody could do. Uh, because we are very divided. We are living uh, in separate political worlds, and the partisan divide uh, has gotten higher and higher, deeper and deeper, and hard for people to cross over. Uh, that great book of a few years ago, The Big Sort, you know, we live with people who believe like we do, and we listen to them, and we get into our echo chambers, and that is exacerbated by what we watch on TV, listen to on the radio, and read online. So you don't have to have a conversation with anybody who disagrees with you. And I think well, that's... you had to. I did. I did. <laughs> yeah. And, and I sought them out. You know, one of the really most poignant experiences, and I, I write about it, is, you know, I, I went to coal country, and I sat there, and I listened to the fears and the anxieties that people had. Um, but we have to take it out of the political realm and put it into the, you know, citizenship uh, arena. You know, listen to each other, learn from each other, and do it with a, a sense of openness and effort to see what is motivating somebody else. Now, that doesn't mean you know, you all of a sudden have to forget your values and your beliefs. I mean, I really uh, think that some people are espousing horrible points of view, and they are not going to be people that I'm going to have much in common with. But the vast majority of people, they have legitimate questions and concerns on all sides of the political uh, divide. And I think we have to find more opportunities to have those conversations and to set up you know, community programs to make that happen. So you have the book coming out in September. You're going to turn 70 in October. What's the next chapter for you? I have no idea. Uh, and I don't really, I don't have any reason to have any idea. I am, uh, you know, going to uh, do everything I can uh, to support the resistance. That's going to be my uh, All right. <laughs> mission. <clears throat> and I, um, I, you know, I am a congenital organizer, so I've set up a new group called Onward Together, and you can go online and, and uh, learn about it. And I'm, I took my leftover campaign funding and put it into this group uh, to help a lot of these these young startups that I'm so impressed with, a lot of young people who woke up after that election and you know, said, look, we've got to do something about this. We've got to get people to register to vote. We've got to get people to run for office. We have to train them. We have to go to town halls. And it's been thrilling to me because it is exactly what should be done. So I'm going to do everything I can to help grow that and support it and especially to you know, find and uh, you know, learn about and, and uh, hopefully see win uh, candidates, not just in the big ticket offices, but from, you know, the ground level up. Library boards, school boards, city councils, county commissions, they are critical in this time when we're going to have to both continue to find ways to work together and make progress together and to fend off whatever, uh, you know, damage may be coming from Washington. So. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be as active as I can because, as you said, I'm, that's who I am. That's my DNA. Well, we've, we're, we're out of time. I will say Hillary has left a little surprise at the door. Some, some, some things. I'm not going to say what they are. Just go to the door. Um, and I want to say thank you, Hillary, for your service to our country, for being such an inspiration to us. Thank you, booksellers. And we can't wait to read your book.